some type of venue that you would like for us to return next year. Before I introduce our speaker, let me take a moment to remind you, if you are using Twitter, we encourage you to join the conversation by using the hashtag Kings14 and any other relevant hashtags in your tweets. In the event of an emergency requiring evacuation, an alarm will sound, activating a voice message instructing attendees to leave the building via the nearest emergency exit. Exit signs and strobe lights will flash, proceed calmly to the nearest safest exit door or stair stairwell. Finally, please be sure to take a moment to complete the evaluation for the session and turn it into the program assistance as you leave the room. And actually, you can just put them on your table or um, leave them in the back. Um, we do have paper evaluations for this particular session. These were, again, spontaneous, selected last minute from um, uh, people that submitted topics. And uh, so uh, we didn't have them available in the online mobile evaluation form. But uh, so please. Make sure that you let us know your feedback. So we are delighted to have you join us in this new and exciting venue at HIMSS 14 this year. Your turn was developed after the in-conference concept and meant to be an unstructured and spontaneous. Speakers and topics were chosen based on current topics in the industry expected to generate a high level of interactive discussion without a formal PowerPoint presentation. I would, like, I would now like to introduce um, our, our speaker who will provide us with more information on this topic. Travis Vaughn Kiersink, founder and CEO, is a proven leader and entrepreneur with experience taking companies from idea conception through product development and into lucrative exits. A healthcare technology disruptor, <laughs> Travis's creativity, energy, and ahead of its time vision for Kiersink products and services allow him to lead Kiersink working on design usability, business development, investor relationships, internal culture, and brand awareness through thought leadership. Now please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mr. Travis Vaughn. Thank you, Travis. Well, good afternoon. I know it's 4 o'clock and at least this room has chairs, so all of those of you who have been on your feet are probably grateful that you're like, if nothing else, your feet get to rest for an hour. I, um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to Hims and, uh, and for everyone coming here because I think really the problems that we have in healthcare really is just one. I mean, if you really think about how complex we've created this thing called the healthcare institution, if you will, it's really we've created just mayhem when it comes to communicating. We've really just violated a lot of the good principles around solid communication, effective communication. What we did on stone tablets, we then found paper. And then when we found paper, then we found electronics. But we did very little to ever spread the word effectively, consistently in a way, I think, to have the message have feet, for it to be consumed and reapplied and spread. And so I think I want to start the discussion because I really want to hear other people's thoughts on this. But let me sort of tease you for a second. I think when we industrialized America, we broke healthcare. And I think that we broke healthcare because what we had is we had a pretty good way of treating people. And that was the doctor would go where? To the home. And when you would go to the home, it's an interesting thing that happened. There was no white coat effect at the home. Right? There was no triage with the nurse down the street you know, uh, equivalent. It is a place where I am looking and examining you, and I'm talking to the family. I'm getting a full clinical picture as to what happened. I'm coming up with a diagnosis, a potential treatment plan, and who am I sharing it with? The whole family. Right? And sometimes, you know, we talk to a lot of other physicians, and they say, you know, wow, I can remember when. Uh, matter of fact, one of the, our colleagues at work, he says, you can remember when he first got <laughs> immunized in the butt, the neighbors came by to see what this was all about. It was really a community of communication about healthcare. And then what we tried to do was what? We tried to do everything that we else were doing, and that was mass produce it. Let's mass produce rifles for World War I, let's mass produce cars through Henry Ford, let's mass, 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 mass. And then when that sort of message got to healthcare, what did we do? We put doctors in exam rooms and we now create the mass production of bringing the patient to the factory, and the factory is the healthcare environment. So, the question is, how do we sort of get patients engaged when, quite frankly, over the last 60 years, we've alienated them? And what we've done is we've created now a few generations 
that have literally been socialized to be what? Passive, which is the exact opposite of engaging, <coughs> is it not? And so if you believe on that premise, and I, and I welcome you all to challenge it, then I think that once we understand that we've created passive people, we're not communicating effectively with them, their care teams, and with other care members, then it is a new and a fresh way to approach solving the problem, a problem which I would humbly submit to you, I don't think we could have solved until the last couple of years because what has happened in terms of tectonic shifts in healthcare? Three things which I think create a perfect storm. One, healthcare reform. Two, the age of consumerism. Think about that for a second. We have created an entire new library of isms. When I went to college, we studied, studied capitalism, right? And we were told through Adam Smith, we vote for our dollars. In the enterprise of entrepreneurs and others create value. They have consumers. Those consumers vote with those dollars. They perpetuate business models, and that's how we service an economy, right? But now we have Amazonism. Yelp-ism, Foursquare-ism. We have all these new isms in the sense that you can vote and change opinion without ever spending a dime. And so there's this new sense of the age of consumerism that is now putting us into a place, and I think that if you really look at it, healthcare is the last bastion that has tall walls around it. And if you sort of look in your heads for a metaphor, we as consumers are beating down the wall. Because as we are saddled with more and more of the healthcare responsibilities in terms of spending, we now want to mimic the same type of behavior of consumer that we do on Amazon, eBay, Best Buy, the mall, as we do now for healthcare. And so healthcare reform, age of consumerism, and then lastly, which is what I love, this is something that we didn't have years ago. Does anyone want to admit that they won't even go to the bathroom without this thing? <laughs> And so when you are wired to be on this thing all the time, your brain changes the way it wants to communicate. And if you think about communication as really the solve for the great problem, look at what the iPhone did. It is a master single sign-on platform, is it not? If we had to do username and passwords for every stinking app we loaded on here, we wouldn't use it, would we not? And so we are able to communicate with lots of apps because they're quick, they're available, and they're mobile. And so I think that this is a communication tool. It kind of reminds me of Star Trek, right, and the things that we used to watch with William Shatner. His ability to communicate and their ability to diagnose in the mobile sort of environments with tricorders and these things, really what they were doing, they were talking about mobility. And what they were really doing was talking about how I can communicate. And whether it is beam me up Scotty or Jim, it's worse than that, he's dead. You are, you are basically communicating a fact. And that's how providers consume you as a person when you have the label of patient. They are consuming data points. And then they're consuming data points. Those goes into an algorithm to which then they come up with a diagnosis. And then they match it up with a treatment plan. But what happens? Nearly 90% of us forget he or she said the time we get to, what, six months? A. Three months B. C a week, or D, by the time we get to the car. Institutes of Medicine says it's D. Eight, upper 80th percentile is what we cannot effectively communicate what the doctor said by the time we get to the car. I mean, we are so confused and we're unable to consume what is being said about us that we can't even get to the point where we can get out to a place to pick up our cell phone, call our wife, our parents, our children, whomever, to now communicate what the doctor said. So, I think this, though it may be somewhat of an overused term this year, I think that if we look at engagement as a communication problem, you know, one of the things, I remember once that somebody came up to me, and it was so clever, I had to memorize it, but someone tried to trick me and they said, let's talk about these psychologically complex dwellings between the parallel themes about juncture and ambiguity. And that was a very clever graduate term in med school, but the point was, there's no way I have any clue what you just said. How can anyone stay engaged in that sort of line of communication? So I will open up to you the floor that I think we have a communication problem. I think that these are primarily four large buckets that you could assign the communication problems to. 
And I think that this perfect storm is giving us at least some optimism to solve some of these things. So with that, give me all your wisdom because I'm growing a business and I need to learn the cheap way. Questions, answers? Oh, I'm sorry. I write, I write small. As a matter of fact, I was so scared that I might misspell something, right? No, no, no. I was just, um, I remember when Dan Quell did this once and that sort of ended his career. So if I was going to misspell a word, I wanted it to be really, really small. So, and the word potato hopefully does not show up here. So I think that first off is access, right? We don't have access to the things that people are saying about us. How many in this room have ever read what a provider wrote about us? Well, other than Dr. Alexander, the great Dr. Alexander from his talk in Madison, Ohio in the back, not many of us do, right? Meaningful use. I underlined, though you can't see it, the M men. We talk about, from a government perspective, meaningful use with a capital M. Let me submit to you that if you want patient engagement, you need meaningful use with a lowercase m. They need to be able to consume it, right? One to five yellow stars on all Amazon products. Very simple to consume. Drill down if you want, but they have created analytics within a weighted score of one to five on how good that thing is. That's meaningful. That's meaningful data. Communicate. Here's what I like about things that we can do that we couldn't do before. What is the most widely used medical device in the United States? <coughs> the fax machine. Everybody's got one. Everyone. Even the EMRs have now just turned them into electronic. They're embedded <coughs> in the workflow process. In, in, the, in the software, everybody's got a fax number. Because they still do what? They consume communicated data to them from consultants, <coughs> from diagnostic facilities and others. But what if the patient now gets to fax their record, now gets to fax what it is they're doing in a format that they'll consume it? The ability to now start to be part of a meaningful component of communicating from the patient side when they have access and a meaningful way to communicate it, I think will be a tectonic shift in terms of an appreciation for the physician, for the patient. And I'll say something about communicate. When I went to med school, University of South Florida, plug for them, great school. Um, 2023, I'll be done paying off all my student loan debts. Very excited about that day in May um, coming up. Is that they taught us how to disarm people that came in with WebMD printouts. I mean, we didn't get any. There's two courses they never taught us on. One was coding, and the other one was vegetables. But other than that, they pretty much gave us a class on everything. And so it was people coming in with sort of this third-party opinion called WebMD. And I think that what that did is that WebMD, which then went on to create a billion-plus dollar company, gave lots of content. We were then, as providers, showing how that comp that content did not reach the scale or the level of confidence. And what we did is that we really robbed an opportunity to communicate. And then lastly, and this is what excites just the heck out of me, is that Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Salesforce, all of these collaboration pieces of software have pervaded our life at home and at the work. It gives us a sense that it's okay to share information. <coughs> and if you really think about Facebook, their, their, um, their hot product was pictures. It began with pictures of people at Harvard, but then it went on with pictures. Because what are those? Those, I have access. It's meaningful to me, right? She's cute, she's ugly, he's cute, he's ugly. That was Harvard, right? I'm able, able to vote and communicate around it, right? And then now we can talk about it. That's Facebook. And then that, that's the mother of engagement platforms. 1.1 billion users, right? Um, I think that Mark Zuckerberg just went and stroked a $16 billion check for WhatsApp, right? Year before that, $1 billion for Instagram. The average age of a Facebook user is 40 years old, though. It's shifting. It's shifting, I believe, because it's meaningful and you collaborate on it, right? 
When grandma friends you, you know it's time to find another digital home. <laughs> but it's true. But the point of it, it, it sort of followed these rules. So hopefully now you don't have to read it. But those are sort of the, the, the four corners, if you will, of what I think, if we wanted to frame engagement, how we would tackle it. Is there a cricket in the room? Dr. Alexander, I'm going to pick on you, sir. So, what's the difference between you talking to a patient or the patient's mother in terms of engagement? Well, that's, I was just saying you can think of Google Health. Google Health spent about a billion, a billion dollars. Google spent a billion dollars on Google Health. And you know, the tool is a patient engagement tool, patient portal, patient personal health record. Um, but it wasn't engaging. It wasn't important to me. And something that I've often thought about is with personal health records and patient portals and things like that. Most people, throughout most of their days, if they're otherwise healthy, don't really care about this stuff. They care about paying the bills, and getting the kids fed, and getting the laundry done, and getting to work on time, and watching their favorite TV show. It's only when healthcare becomes critical to them, becomes important to them, as you said, that it moves up into the line of duty. And to make healthcare engaging is not just providing a tool. It has to be something that provides that it's meaningful to me. It's fun. It's something that makes me want to do it over again. I get a, an increase in my endorphins when I do it, my dopamine surges, whatever. But having a tool that people can go in and type in a bunch of data on, which is otherwise not very reinforcing, uh, is not going to get it there. So I guess one, to me one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest barriers is the lack of engagement or engagingness to the <laughs> Well, I also, I was just going to, I think, when I would say that I look at the surge of users on the products like Fitbit, mm -hmm. and I think what makes those tools work is that you are, you are documenting positive behaviors in your life, and then you're sharing those with other people, or if you're managing a chronic disease, you know, it's, you probably don't get the endorphin rush by saying, oh, man, my glucose numbers are bad again. You know, it's, just, <laughs> it's that immediate feedback, yeah. that immediate gratification that you get by using something that provides you something today, right now, that's a value to you. But I think it's also the focus on the positive that a lot of the wellness apps have, that if your patient engagement, I don't think we've figured that out yet. How to make that feel like something that feels empowering and like I'm taking a step in the right direction as opposed to I'm documenting something going on with me that may not be the greatest thing ever. We agree with you, right? Um, we founded the, the company it was very intrigued by a company. Anybody know Zappos? Right? Very interesting. I mean, really, buying shoes online, okay? The VCs are like, oh, I don't know, you know, not until you're profitable, you know? I mean, there is a sense, like, that's a crazy business model because people want to try on a shoe, right, before. But it was very interesting that they created a culture of happiness. And a very interesting thing is we started to, to study this happiness as a science is you found out that really all the funding that came into psychology has been funded by the DOD post-wars. P, you know, PTSD, all of these things. That's where the funding came from. So what happened was is that we had a skew in the funded science towards disease, states of unhappy, states of less than optimal function. And so we have all this data on what's wrong with you. And now we call that the DSM-4 criteria, right? And we have a whole book for it, right? But we have very, very little unhappy. Or DSM-5, thank you, I know. Yeah, I missed that class, but they just came out with it, right? Um, Zappos, I forget the, the CEO's name, but he wrote about it in some blogs. And it really, and you started to look at it, the um, American Psychology Association, I can't pronounce it, Smibbleman or something like that, he said, look, we as an organization are, are going to study positive health for once. And this positive psychology literally is only about 12 years old. But it's based into four components. Perceived control. People, when they have a sense of control, they are happier. Right? Fitbit, other things, give us a sense of control. Right? Perceived progress. Fitbit does a wonderful job of giving you that little leaf and all this stuff. You have a very much an instant gratification on where you are progressing. 
The next one is being part of something bigger than yourself, right? Haitian, or, you know, Haitians get flooded by tornado, hurricanes, and so forth. We send money. We feel part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And then lastly, being part of the community, something that you identify with locally around yourself. And, it, and they found that in these four categories, if you scored high, you really then scored as a person who was happy. And so it was very interesting that the guy at Zappos really embedded a lot of that in their HR for training and so forth. One of the companies that literally will put you through six weeks of orientation and pay you to quit. I think it used to be 1500 it might be 2000 now. Literally will write you a check to go away. And the sense was is that if this is not a right cultural fit for you, you're not going to stay. We would never do such a thing in healthcare. I mean, there are just things that we would never think about in terms of underscoring the positiveness. You know, I think that I've often had debates. I don't think people want to be sick. Even the hypochondriacs don't want to be sick. What they're really looking for is engagement. They want attention, right? And, and, it's, and if given attention, how could we change disease progression, right? You know, there's a whole thing, yes, sir. I was going to say, they want attention, but they want attention without judgment. Because, for instance, people will often tell their healthcare provider a completely different story about their compliance with medication regimen, for instance. Oh, sure, Doc, I take every pill every single day, just like I'm supposed to. When you track it, you can find that that's not true. But also, if they talk to something that is non judgmental an animated character or, 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 or an avatar or something like that, they're much more likely to tell the honest story and to say, no, I forget it three days out of four. Um, so I think they want that engagement, but they also don't want that, okay, it's going to tell me I'm not, being, you know, not doing the right thing, and that's not going to So that's a bit of a challenge, too. Is it, 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 it can't be threatened. You know, if you think, though, from a patient's perspective, when you have 11 minutes with a provider, it's very hard to come across sincere. I mean, it just is, right? I mean, you think about all the cars that come off the factory floor in the hundreds of thousands, and there's a recall by hundreds of thousands. And then you have Bentley that are all handmade, you know, by one person, right? There is a sense that sincerity is a thing that can be communicated or a thing that can be ignored and screams louder than the words that come out of it. I don't think, personally, we can beat up physicians any more than they already are. I, I, you, know, you walk the floor and you look at solutions, and they want to sell the doctor something to do patient engagement. And if I'm the doctor, I'm thinking, what in the heck else could you make me do? I have 42,000 things I have to do to document a me and M code. I have all these other things I need to do to sort of get extra credit for wellness. And then now you want to teach me a way that I should effectively communicate. I don't think you can really put any more burden on the engagement model of the provider. I think, and this is just my personal opinion, I think most people went to med school because they sincerely wanted to make a difference. I think they became grumpy when they found out they weren't. And I will tell you that when you are about your second year in med school and everybody wants to quit, it's too late. I mean, they're just, it financially doesn't become feasible, and so you just get grumpier, right? And so I think that if we're going to lead the way in changing how the quote-unquote term of patient engagement happens, how it grows as a concept, I think that we really need to focus on those assets that are the most underutilized, and that's the patient and their family. I mean, if Facebook can't prove to you that people want to communicate, then nothing else will. But in the constraints of the thing we call healthcare doesn't really allow for communication, then how would we really expect for them to be engaged? You know, we went through an interesting process of, um, of shopping for venture capital. It's very interesting. There are those who get it, and you want to talk to them more, and there are those who sort of go <coughs> over it. And it always in my mind, when sort of making these presentations, I thought about, are they engaging and know what I'm talking about it? Or are they just listening for keywords? And when they're looking for keywords, they sound a hell of a lot like physicians. I'm sorry, we'll have to bleep that out of the tape. 
Um, but am I right or wrong? I mean, just think about it for your own personal life. If there are people who don't want to engage and listen to you, you disengage, right? And so, I think technology, wearable tech, is going to do a lot for us to express data points that we will consume as if we were in a mirror, which is what the Fitbit, Nike, Fuel Band, and others do. Then an audience, which is then the people we had to look at that data. And then the competitive nature of then trying to basically use those data points as sort of the hierarchy. I mean, you know, one of the interesting things about all the armies in the world, they give medals. You know, I mean, how many millions of people have probably died in the thought that they'd get a medal? And how I think it's so neat that so many softwares have now said, we'll give you a medal. Not sure what they mean, but they mean something, right? How many of us can tell us our Facebook friend count? Or LinkedIn, right? I like how they go 500 plus. They just gave up, right? After that, it's, it's sort of, it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, but it's important for us to measure things. And I think that if we use what has worked to engage people in other sectors, then I think we'll solve the engagement problem when we do this. We increase the confidence of the patient to communicate. By nature, they'll be diagnosed as engaged at least is my theory. I think the provider, which over 85% last year of the providers that were surveyed said that they were moderately to severely dissatisfied with the job. That's huge. I mean, if you were like an employer and you thought that 85 plus percent of your employees were moderate to severely unhappy, you would think you'd have a crisis. That's just standard for us, right? And so we're wondering why so many physicians are allowing to be consumed by hospitals is because they're not getting the same type of engagement that they wanted themselves. And that was going back to this sort of perceived control, perceived progress, being part of something bigger than yourself, was to actually feel like you're making a difference. And so when they were robbed of that, I think, sort of just kind of put the death knell into breaking the whole communications model and now everybody is disengaged. I mean, if you are pharma, if you are a diagnostic creator or whatever, one of the things that you know to speak the love language to a provider is what? We're a billable code, right? Yeah, if you buy our thing or do our thing or write for this, this is that code. Well, we've incentivized them with money, but in the, in the process, we've sort of taken away a lot of the happiness of the other stuff that was positive. And that was positively make a difference, right? I am really running out of words. I mean, I probably start talking about my childhood at this point. Does anyone else have thoughts? How about you? You've sort of looked like you're extremely intelligent. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> a high bar. <laughs> um, so I think uh, there's a big uh, relevance question. I think that's probably what you're getting at with your small and new. Right? And, uh, um, there are two things that I've ever I'm not a physician and I didn't stay at a holiday in. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, patient engagement is uh, pointing at two things. One, the leading is the capital MU, which is probably the wrong starting point. I understand why, but seriously, I mean, that's kind of out of touch with what consumers are interested in. Um, and then the other, uh, there's talk about you know, uh, patient accountability. And mm -hmm. while that's probably the right thing, you start beating people over the head with accountability, that doesn't feel quite right either. So there's got to be a way to sort of goose people into this, I think. And the self-referential aspects of the wearables is really interesting. And there's got to be a way to sort of pile on. The problem with them, I think, is that there remains a disconnect between what that is and what health really is, when it really shouldn't be, right? I mean, these things seem to really need to be playing together much uh, uh, more nicely. Can somebody be thinking about this now as a toy or I'm trying to uh, count my steps, and yes, that has health benefits, and I'm thinking about that, but really what I'm doing is I'm counting steps. And I'm not talking to my doctor about that, right? So that's there's still a lot of disconnect between all of these things that ultimately should be connected in a way that isn't beating either the doctor or the patient over the head with something, right? So that's 
So, yeah, I think it's. I think you're right. I um, I love the statistics it's talking about in terms of wearable tech. You know, it's a multi tens of billion dollars <coughs> industry by 2015. Um, I mean, everybody except 7-Eleven is now producing a device that's going to be a wearable tech, right? I think the ease of data input is a big deal here, right? And it's so, because the currency for communication is data, it's facts, and the patients rarely have it, except chief complaint. I mean, we built an EMR, trust me, we give this much to the patient and that much to the doctor, right? Chief complaint, those are your words, that's all you get, you know, now sit over there. You know, and now we're going to break millions of lines of code about what the doctor is going to talk about you, about and bill for you, and it will be you know, really cool. I think that relevance is so important because one of the things that intrigued me about Fitbit, um, you know, is that they they turned the the pedometer into something that was um, fun, right? But they also gave you a way to sit there and game yourself. You know, before they had an opportunity to share it with your friends. And I was amazed at how much weight people were losing. And it occurred to me, it's like, you know, we make cars with dashboards. <laughs> we make dashboards for the business. We make all kinds of these analytics for the things that can basically buy them. But what does a person really get, right? Well, we got Facebook friends now. I mean, so we're starting to count and do something in our lives and get positive reinforcement for it. But I think wearable tech will come a long way to legitimize what the person is trying to tell the provider. And that relevance is a really, is a really big thing, I think. I think there's room in our economy to sort of revitalize how physicians and providers feel about what they do. Because I'll remember, um, oh, and by the way, I'm not a real doctor. I dropped out of my third year, so don't want anybody to think I am. Um, it's the, um, it had a happy ending story, but it was, it was the fact that it really did see like a gloomy path to continue because um, Mrs. Bradley, first person that ever died on me as a patient, you know, died in 305 of a morphine overdose at a very reputable hospital because the attending gave for injectable. Some guy came in and gave her a PCA, and she did both. You know, lung cancer would have died eventually because we operated on her that day. She was here. But there are things that you think, wow, those are just failures to communicate. I mean, you know, and here we're in this huge research institution that people fly all over the world to come live, and not to sort of get goofed up and become one of the hundred thousand and die. So I think, and it, and it really it affected me, right? Because Mrs. Bradley's family after the surgery, I told her, everybody's going to be fine, right? And I come back that morning, and then I hear about this procedure that if the chart has a giant rubber band on it and it's underneath versus in the rack below, that means they've passed away. And it was sort of a, I was like, wow. Then I'm like, well, what did I do wrong? You know, some, you know thinking, wow, you know, where did all this happen? And it was, just, it was issues with communication. But a, an affluent family, they were very engaged. And so it was just these areas of things that just went wrong that were small, and she basically just breathed so shallow that she, you know, basically suffocated. I think that we do have an opportunity to take things that give data in a meaningful way. And then this is my last point. We all perform for what? An audience. And that excites me. Because what Facebook found out with in their first acquisition, which was FriendsFinder, right? That if you had how many friends, you'd come back? Five. Okay, is that if you had five friends, you were going to come back and stay on Facebook. If you had, or less, you abandoned the site. And that proved to me, and certainly to Mark Zuckerberg, in their first acquisition was 40 million. Boy, they've added zeros on that since then. Um, that you, we want audiences to perform for, right? Good, bad, or indifferent, we need to know that the communication that we're sending out is being mirrored back to us. And I think providers would like to be part of that audience legitimately. But you're not speaking their language, and their language is typically data. <coughs> so I think that we can improve and tear down some of the barriers, you know, as it comes to patient engagement, just by enabling them with data, I believe. Um,
how many tests in a given year are ordered that are duplicates? <coughs> Take a guess. Meaning that it's absolutely just, it's a redo, wasn't required, nothing clinically says they should have reordered it. More than five. <laughs> yeah, somebody is awake in the audience. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's 36%. Right? I mean, that's a lot. Who wants to get poked twice, irradiated twice, you know, run on something twice, you know, something, anything twice when they didn't have to, unless they just absolutely had nothing to do. I mean, 36% are performed? Are duplicates, meaning that the provider ordered for them again. And so let's say that you did um, a chest x-ray or a mammogram three times a year. Everybody knows it's ridiculous, right? I mean, it's once a year after the woman has, has turned 40, right? There's just sort of this protocol. Well, if I don't have the data on the mammogram and you're in my office, what do I feel compelled to do? Order another one, right? And so, and then because that results somewhere is off in the nether regions and, you know, it's, it's drifting around in space somewhere or it's still being read overseas or something. But the point of it is, is that providers are engaged for facts and when they don't have them, they'll go and get them again and so we drive up care. Interesting, another result, how many of us who have ever taken a meds list to a physician or to an ER, how many of those were inaccurate? 38%. Okay, so now let's think about that in dog years. We're trying to say we have a failure to communicate, right? A third of the time, they don't get part of the communicated message that they're wanting to hear, and when they hear it, they know over a third of the time it's wrong. So no wonder it's like Charlie Brown and a wah, wah, wah in their ears, because they're confident that your meaningful part, that your relevance to the equation has sunk in so low. And so I think that part of the relevance equation is that when we get to the content, to then ascribe to the level of confidence, then I think that providers will finally get to be in front of what they always hoped they would be when they studied something in college that if they did not get into med school, they would be processing orange juice for the rest of their life, like a chemistry degree, um, to now start to get that audience and the reinforcement that they need. Any other thoughts? Jay, how about you? You're a brilliant guy. Yeah. Um, you know, I know patient engagement is a big theme at HIMSS, and uh, I, I think you did a nice job highlighting that someone has to engage the patient, someone or something, and you can't really ask the doctor to do it, so who's going to do it? Yeah, I that's, that's still an open question for me. Well, I know that there are many models to engage them. I think that at least in our business model, it is the brute force step of just going out and getting all the records from all their providers. You know, giving them, you know, the access, giving them the relevance that they need that they now can communicate and collaborate around it. So when you do that, how many actually collaborate? All of them. I don't fact, believe it. I'm sorry. Huh? I don't believe it. <laughs> so, I mean, in healthcare, it's a combination of the doctor not having the full picture and the patient, whether the patient wants to be engaged. Right. So, I mean, you, we, you know, we're in uh, especially pharmacy business, and we provide an awful lot of data, and we have a lot of patients that really do not want to face the unfortunate facts of what they're dealing with. And despite many different types of methods of engagement, they really don't want to be engaged. I mean, so I mean, I mean, there's a combination of it's. it's I mean, there's people that have Fitbits who wear it because it's a fad, and in fact, they're not engaged by it. So I mean, I think it's broader. I, I don't know if we really understand the psyche of the patient well enough, based on different disease types and different people types, to really understand how we best engage all these different types of patients and diseases. Completely agree. And I was not inaccurate when I said everybody, because everyone that's used our system is a voluntary user. Yeah. Um, and then I can tell you that statistically, everyone that signed on to our system has added 2.7 people in their audience, at least as of today. 
And so I would also agree with you, agree with you strongly, is that it is very difficult to get engagement from the person, but it's a lot easier to get engagement by the audience. That's true. And so, and that's when you broaden the net from a hook to a net. Um, I like the instance where um, I did sleep medicine for a long time before I went to med school. And, you know, the, the classic truck driver would come in, overweight, sleep test, apnea, CPAP, you know, the sort of just check, 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 check. They weren't particularly engaged all the time. But you know what, who was? The wife, right? There was somebody saying, well, if he doesn't drive the truck, we don't get a paycheck and I don't eat. Or we don't eat. Or the kids don't eat. And so I think that when we shift our focus to more of a community approach, you know, the original social network, which is the family, then we are able to use more of our tools to sort of push that object from up, down. We get into more of a 3D model, X, Y, and Z axis, right? Um, and I don't think everybody does want to be engaged, quite frankly. And that's the beauty of it. I mean, the, the beauty of it is, is that, you know, statistically, apparently 100% of us do have a mother and a father, right? I mean, we did come from somewhere. And so there are those that are, we are, we are literally birthed into a unit of support. Now, whether they were given up for adoption or whatever, the point of it is, is that we are fundamentally designed to connect and reproduce. And I think that it is that natural tendency to want to communicate, to build an audience, to have support on, right? I mean, a person gets abandoned on an island. I mean, even the movie, uh, what is it, Survivor or whatever, right? You know, Tom Hanks makes a partner out of a volleyball, right? Wilson. I mean, there just is, in, you know, a deep coded right at the RNA level for us to communicate. And I think that eventually we'll find our models to do that. One of the things that you think about it, I'll ask you a question, pull it on, please all vote. Is HIPAA a good thing for patient engagement or a bad thing? All it says is a good thing, raise your hand. All those who believe that it's a bad thing, raise your hand. I will have to agree with those that are bad. It gave us another excuse to not communicate, right? We need a business associates agreement. We, the pharmacists, need this or that. Or, you know, clearly he wrote for the wrong drug, but now I need to go to the doctor and, you know, sort of start that process over again. We've done a lot of things in trying to fix the system that we made it worse. I think, though, if we look at HIPAA as really being the, <coughs> the all-access badge that patients should be wearing around their neck in the United States to say, it's my record, I want it, I'm using my power of HIPAA to access it, and I think that that is, is certainly part of just the education process that we as consumers need to sort of learn as it comes to healthcare. All right, I think we're almost out of time, unless anyone has any... Four minutes, and does anybody have any more questions, or? But the young lady over here, anything that's really cool? I'm just trying to, does anybody have strategies that they're using to engage their patients? I, I've been implementing an HIE and a patient portal and struggling with how I'm going to get 5% of my elderly population to log into the patient, patient portal when they don't even have, when they have like dial-up sort of rural communities. What are you guys doing? I mean, I mean, what we're trying to do is do strategies that gives the patient a variety of choices and how they want to be engaged. So maybe some that want printed materials, and someone that wants a, you know, a patient portal, and you know, and someone who wants to be able to call 24/7, you know, and talk to somebody. So you know, we're we're trying to you know, and and try to determine those. Patients who want their family engaged and those patients who don't. So we're trying to do a very broad approach, but I have to tell you that is very difficult. It takes a lot of resources to do that, and you have a lot, and you have to have a technology that allows you to document all those exceptions, so that when someone's on the phone with the patient, they know the patient's preferences. So we're we're I think we're struggling like you guys are, you know, on how best to optimize you know, the impact on the broader population. I think we do really good on sub subpopulations. You know, um, that, you know, we can identify certain subpopulations within certain diseases, and we can engage them really well. But it's a minority of the population, unfortunately, unless you have a broad net of inducements that satisfies their, their need. We find six to eight percent of our whole population does not want to engage them no matter what mechanism. 
they prefer to call us when they want something. And but we're still working awful hard on the other 92 to 94 percent on how we can, you know, um, you know, better meet their needs. And and I, I, we're, I mean, admittedly, we're, we're struggling. It's like you are. We're, we're in the same uh, fraternity. So can you do a seat on my marketing lady, and I don't know this, I know with physicians, you know, the anti-kickback and all that, you can't do drawings or anything over $35, but can you do things like that for patients to get them, you know, register and send a message and you'll be entered in, like a drawing for Starbucks, I don't know. That was my that? idea. $20 Starbucks gift card giveaway right. in one week or one month. Okay. You'll get 5% of patients. So, is that, there's no law against that? I haven't looked into it yet. Uh, yeah, I've heard of a, a hospital system in New Jersey who is rolling out their HIA and uh, offered gift cards as an incentive for, okay. for their patients to, uh, to sign on to the portal. I think once you get in there, they'll see, and that's the engagement, once you get in there, they'll see that it can save them time and it's good to have everything in one spot, but until you get in there, you have well, to give them something that they can get Well, back. here's another question. How many people here have patients that will not give you their email address? Great. I don't get my email address. I know, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah. I mean, there's a variety yeah. of challenges in trying to... Well, know, they don't want you to have any of their personal information. <laughs> well, no, no, the issue, the issue with the email address is that... The issue with the email address is that they know that businesses sell their email address and other pertinent information to, to uh, other, you know, uh, marketing companies. So they don't, they don't want, the first question they ask us is, so how many additional emails will I get that are not from you by, by, by me giving you the, your, my email address? And even though you tell them that we don't sell the data, we don't give the data away, it's surprisingly not the percentage of patients that will not give us their email address. But with the security issues right now, I mean, like the whole shopping at Target, I mean, I get why people oh, yeah. want to give that information out because I may not readily give out, you know, my company's not going to give this address to any of our, you know. Oh, the same but way. what's, yeah, what if somebody came in and somehow you got hacked, then it's getting out there anyway. So I understand because it's so, prevalent in the media right now, all of these breaches, and it just makes the engagement so much harder because... Is your, is your portal updated and available real time? Like you could include it as part of your discharge process to go ahead and log the patient in prior to leaving the facility? Where, I mean, you have a captive audience. Yeah, we can do that at some of our facilities because we have a patient experience person, but our smaller facilities don't have that, and our nurses so the CNO pushes to not have the nurses do it, and the CMO doesn't want the physician to do anything. So it's kind of finding the FTE to really take ownership of it and you know want to make it work at each of the at each of our facilities. So that is what we're doing at a couple. But we have 22 facilities, and three of them have a patient experience. And we have certain programs that we have to have the patients opt in. Yeah. You know, and. Um, we usually can get them to opt in after talking to them a number of times when they finally really understand what the value is for them or, or for or for one of their caregivers. But that's the other piece with HIPAA and other factors that's added. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent. It's just added. It's added steps. It is. Um, I would say this about patient portals. I think it's a a repeat of the sins of our father. Right. I mean, in that. If it's not relevant, it's not meaningful um, because we created a patient portal. How many ATMs do we think would be here if they didn't all talk to each other? I mean, the chances of me, if every bank had an ATM, there would be an entire wall of every bank's own ATM so that you could get cash, right? They had interoperability a long before healthcare even thought about the term. But it's meaningful. I get access anywhere. It's meaningful to me because I, I want money. I can communicate with my bank, and now it gives me currency that I go and I do the things I want to. I think, and I could be wrong, but I think that what wins the day are family portals, not patient portals. Because I think you need relevance and the audience 
to now, because that information grows stagnant. I mean, you asked the question about relevancy terms, or I think one of the terms, how often is it updated, right? I mean, I don't rush to go see what my claims data is from United Healthcare. It's not relevant to me. It probably will be later on when it may affect my premium directly, but, you know, it's once a month check, you know, out of ADP, out of HR. Um, there are a lot of, I think, people that are trying to tackle this problem from, from a different perspective. Um, there's a startup showcase, a bunch of booths in the 7,000th block of this thing. Um, we're in booth 34, but there's a whole bunch of people. You know, you should talk to them. A um, lot of great stats. Uh, Spanish population, English population, uh, both have responded very, very well in some of the rural cities to two-way texting and very engaging. Institute, um, the emergency, um, Institute of Emergency Medicine physicians came out with that October of last year and published some data on that. I think that there are, I think what you have to do is try different baits and you, know, and you fish for these different populations. And I agree, I think that there is a minority part of the population that won't do it. And the reality of it is that will just die off, right? I mean, you know, the younger generation, my two-year-old will drain the battery on every iPhone she can get hold of, right? I did not have to train her, incentivize her, do anything. It's just simple as heck to use, it's entertaining, and she just loves that thing. I think that's the same thing with the patient portal, is give them a reason to sign on. And what we did from a vendor perspective in the first generation is read only. Who can manage their finances with an ATM machine? You know, or investment portfolio. And you couldn't, right? I mean, there's just not enough functionality. And so, um, but I think that once you get there, and then lastly, let's look at, at sort of the personas, you know, the innovators were trying the patient portals the first go round. And the innovators found out there wasn't anything very innovative. And so Facebook was the same way. It had innovative, it had the early adopters, it had the middle adopters, and it had the late adopters. Now everybody piles on, right? I think that's what will happen when we actually change the scope of meaningfulness, little m, to what's available when they log on. Otherwise, you're going to have to buy all the coffee that they can make in New Jersey to get them to participate. Um, and then lastly, they don't get to do anything with the data, right? I mean, do you really think Epic's MyChart is going to let you write stuff to the Epic database as a patient? I mean, if you're at Florida Hospital in Cerner, you need a signed affidavit, notarized affidavit to actually get a username and password for a minor. I mean, there's so many barriers to actually getting into a patient portal for some people. Yeah, there's, there's just no, there's no return on that investment at all. But I just challenge you, I think, to look at things this way. Encourage your vendors and others to invest in technology that broadens the scope, increases audience and meaningfulness. I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.